are we are back on for part two of our three-part series with uh, miniaturist Jill Orlov. If you um, uh, don't know, we have two other parts, so click on those other segments to this series and learn more about Jill Orlov and her work. But um, I'm Darren Scala, and I am the uh, uh, founder of D. Thomas Fine Miniatures, uh, gallery and retail destination, and we're here to talk today with Jill Orloff, she's a miniaturist out of Baltimore, Maryland. And um, just a little bit, if you want to learn more about Jill um, from a lifestyle approach, um, listen to the first segment of this three-part series. But this second segment, actually we're going to do a, a little bit of a deeper dive into um, and talk more about um, Jill Orloff's miniatures. The first part talks a little bit more about her uh, introduction to um, to the art world, uh, moving from the world of architecture. But we want to spend the next, let's say, 20 minutes or so to learn a little bit more about Jill Orlov's miniatures themselves. So, um, and we're really, uh, if you, and we, why don't we just take a few minutes to talk a little bit about, oh, I hear doggy in the background. Yay. Um, they can't be hidden. <laughs> no. Um, but let's, let's, why don't we do this set up for us, Jill, a little bit more about the the art that you do uh, around this world of miniatures. Um, we talked a little bit about it in the first segment about the cigar box miniatures, but talk a little bit about your approach to miniatures, what kind of miniatures you create um, for us. Um, well, they are typically, I guess you would call them vin room vignettes. I mean, they're, they're very architectural once you know my background that makes perfect sense, but they're kind of vignettes of it sort of fan they started out being more um, rooms from you know from my mind or I would research on the internet very traditional very old school classic rooms like a library with library ladders and floor to ceiling bookcases and traditionally designed desks I wouldn't get into that detail that somebody might also do with wood or paper type of, or even molding but um, with the metal, I try to do it, you know, to the same scale as a dollhouse, and I try to get into a lot of detail, um, but make, put my own mark on things. Right. So right. when I see a detail, I think of, you know, what could, what, what steel shape could I build this out of without getting into all the carving and molding exactly. So let's go back to this. So literally, like your 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 first step is sort of, you know looking at imagery, looking at styles, something that you want to replicate in miniature using metal, right? Is that how it's sort of yes. the beginning step? Yes. And Predominantly then, steel, but sometimes I throw in some other metals for color and textural changes, like a little bit of copper mesh or um, I have some brass mm -hmm. uh, salt and pepper shakers are coming up in one of the new pieces. Right. So so literally, um, like, what what's your process? Do you sketch it out? Do you first work in paper? Are you working on a computer? Um, how are you sort of moving it from this insp inspiration in your mind to actually the execution? How does that come about? Well, you, I used to use um, a program that was very easy, um, computer program to to build models called SketchUp. Yeah. And it's basically, you're building it 3D on the computer. And I used to do that, mm. but then I got away from that. So I just research, take um, pho photos from the internet, print them out, have them on my phone, and just um, lay out kind of the, 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 the vignette that I want to capture um, and, and combine different, the essence of each, the, the spaces that I want to capture. So it's a little more freelance, if you will. I mean, it's a little more, you know, it's almost like being, you know, when you, when you, you, it's less technical, it's more like more, much more creative, more artistic. I mean, you're not like well, would, measuring the, would, the chair. Oh, I am. Oh, you are. <laughs> I'm you obsessed are. about measuring down oh, to, I mean, the, the inches, you know, just it, it, I try to keep it as to scale as possible. Right. And so, yeah, no, I have um, all kinds of scales out. I typically work in one to 12, which is classic dollhouse scale. So that's one inch equals one foot. Right, right. So, so you do measure it out to make sure it is within scale. I do, I do. And, but the, and the pieces that you, uh, that you are recreating, let's say, or, or creating in miniature, 
is there is there a full size uh, version of that in real life that you're working off of? Um, in photograph, I mean, uh-huh. or from my head, mm-hmm. my imagination. Um, so yeah, like I, you know, I've built. Um, a, what, I guess you know, I started with the furniture, and and my husband kept saying, you know, why everything's so big? Can't you build some things that we can carry around more easily? So I was trying to get smaller and smaller, and that's how I got into the dioramas Mm -hmm. and then eventually I started a few pieces of just building just the piece of furniture so I have a tiny desk Mm -hmm. that is one of those classic kind of army issue metal they were super heavy desks and I found a version online that was stripped of its paint so I made a miniature version of it and you know if I can't find measurements online then I have to just guess at different things and scale of what a typical desk would be right and uh, yeah you know I I, I want to go back a second because I don't think this was touched upon in the first segment and I think it's really really important that we talk about how you've integrated your miniatures into the full-size furniture pieces that you've created and you know and I don't think we really talk too much about your work creating full-size furniture pieces. Could, could we talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, yeah. So I um, I guess one of the first things, um, well, I guess I would say kind of the second piece that I, after the welding class I took mm-hmm. about six years ago, um, Wait, for so some reason, the first idea I had was to build a dining room table. Wait, so you're going to have and to just talk a little bit, in case people missed the first episode, just talk slightly about your inspiration for to welding, because that's really critical, too. <laughs> so you were inspired to <laughs> so weld. I, I had always age. wanted to take a welding class mm-hmm. and never had the opportunity in college. And our local art school here, MICA, um, offered, they used to offer a continuing ed class in their sculpture department for welding and a friend of mine knew that I wanted to do this and so she said I found a welding class you want to take it together and because we had done glass blowing together we had taken different classes in the past and so this one was a lot more involved you know several weeks and we took the class together right and after the class my first piece that I thought I don't know where this came from but um I had found this big steel frame that was almost done a little bit bigger than dining room size, but that's what I wanted to work with. Hmm. So in that steel leg industrial frame, this two inch square tube frame, I somehow, I think I incorporated the idea of my dollhouse miniature idea to build it in steel. And I made these miniature floating rooms. So it was Hmm. a miniature kitchen on a track below a glass tabletop and a miniature dining room crisscrossing it. So these tiny rooms floating in that steel frame. So it was sort of sculptural furniture or functional art. Yeah, I mean, that I think was, for me, was one of the things that drew me so into wanting to learn more about you and learn more about your process. And because I think just your furniture pieces and the integration of the miniatures into those pieces are... They're just stunning, and they really do go back to this whole idea about uh, of sculptural miniatures. They're almost they are pieces of art. Each furniture piece, although they're functional, clearly you can serve coffee on the coffee table, but yes. you know they're just so interesting, and they're just so um, they're they're just um, wonderful pieces. They're they're wonderful Thank pieces. You. So I um, so that's what drew me in, and but you know what I also think that's so interesting is this whole idea of how we integrate miniatures into our lives because my feeling is that everyone loves miniatures in some way and it's really just about well how you integrate miniatures into your life and people do it differently some people learn to make miniatures some people have doll houses some people like to go out and look at art that are miniatures so you know the fact that you have these functional furniture pieces that have miniatures in them that my feeling is everyone loves is just a wonderful way to integrate and get miniatures into your life so I encourage you, if you're listening to this and listening to this, and you haven't been introduced to Jill's work, that you definitely go online and take a look at um, JillOrLove.com and check out her full furniture pe- furniture pieces because I think they're just wonderful, wonderful works of art that are also functional pieces of furniture. So, yeah. So okay, I'm so glad we're able to talk about that because I wanted to get that out and um, and let people know that not only do you work in miniature but you work in full size as well but you integrate those two pieces together right Uh, so originally my 
my intent for these pieces of furniture was sort of like, so Frank Lloyd Wright wanted to run people's lives. He wanted to tell them what type of clothes to wear, design their clothes, how their furniture was arranged. That's why he had a lot of built-in furniture. So sort of, I mean, it's a stretch, but Mm -hmm. so my pieces of furniture, the idea was either to do custom pieces for people. If you had a kitchen, you wanted me to build in miniature, say you had a Robin's Egg Blue refrigerator, or you always wanted one, Mm -hmm. then I would build a miniature version of your kitchen and put it in a table that I would hope in my original thoughts, that that table would be in your kitchen. So you'd have a miniature um, kitchen in your full-scale kitchen. Or I did a nightstand that I had always hoped would function as a nightstand. But then I had to let go of that control and realize that some people might want the nightstand in their living room. Right. (laughs) So then, so have you actually, have you um, created a kitchen in miniature for, in a custom piece? Not in a custom piece yet, ah, but um, that's a- I have done a few kitchens now. Yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're embedded in the piece of furniture, right? In, uh, both. I've done two separate oh. kitchens that were in the boxes, in the dioramas. Excellent. Um, that was one, one kitchen that's sort of a kind of a diner style kitchen in, mm-hmm. in an old box mm-hmm. and the new one that will be in your show in a couple of weeks. I won't ah, tell any. Right. Cause we're going to talk about that. I don't know if you want in, to reveal that yet. Well, we're going to talk about that in the third segment, but yeah. Okay. So hang in folks and click on the third link to this uh, three part series. Cause we're going to learn more about what's in the show um, starting on May 21st. Um, but I think, I, yeah, I just want to go back to this whole idea about how to bring miniatures into our lives because I, my sense is that everyone loves miniatures in some way. I love this idea of recreating your own, your own kitchen or your own living room or or a very important room into a full size piece of furniture because, um, you know, miniatures trigger so many emotions and I think that's probably one of the reasons why we love them so much because. As children, you know, so many of us are uh, are exposed to miniatures at a very early age. They might even be the first things that we play with as children. So I think there's such an emotional connection to miniatures. So, you know, to have, you know, a kitchen or, you know, a, a living room set that you, you know, that is, that we're all so close to built into a piece of furniture, I think is in a wonderful way to sort of... Um, create that emotional connection to uh, full-size objects that are in our lives all the time. So I encourage you folks, if you're listening now, this is a great idea. It's a great gift idea um, <laughs> for, for yourself or for someone you love. But, um, but it's just a really, really cool concept. So I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, but you're, you're, So you're still working on, on full-size furniture, right? Full size and dioramas and, you know, individual miniature furniture. So you're just So the idea was that, you know, even if you had a dream of a space you always wanted, Uh then I could also build it in miniature. Or if you had a favorite heirloom that was just passed down, or maybe it was lost, and then Uh I could design something around a miniature version of that heirloom chair or heirloom Mm. sofa type of thing. I love it. I love it. Well, you you mentioned the word dream, and I know that you were recently um, part of a very important show centered around miniatures at the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C., and that you created a piece. You were um, commissioned to create a a piece specifically for a show around miniatures. Tell us about that. So that show was called Small Stories, and it was um, a, tr- a, a traveling exhibit. The, the D.C. National Building Museum was the first stop that it was going to be traveling mm-hmm. around the world, leaving from London's Victorian Albert Museum of Childhood. Mm-hmm. And what they did when they had the exhibit there at their, their museum in London was to um, invite maybe about 20 local architects, designers, artists to build these dream rooms they provided them with these maple cubes that were i think about 14 inch of cubes with plexiglass fronts and they didn't give you any more detail other than you know make a child friendly dream room and so then when that exhibit traveled across the atlantic and came to the dc um, building museum they asked american designers architects artists to do these dream rooms and 
I luckily got to do one. So you didn't have a and lot of my, information. They were like, they gave you the size, they gave you the dimensions, yep, they gave you... they sent you the box. Yeah. Oh, they sent you the box. And they said what? Oh, yeah. Go? Create? They said, you know, just make it child-friendly. Make and it I child said, you know, friendly. I work in steel. And they said, yes. <laughs> I was like, because it might be heavy. And so they said, absolutely. So I didn't have any other... Um, there was no other theme to go with. You, you had... You know, anything you could pull out of your imagination. And so one of the TV shows, books that I had always been very fond of was The Borrowers. So do you want me to explain? Yes. My, yes, please. The cons- mine. So The Borrowers, you know, were these miniature people that lived in the walls of this kind of Victorian home. And so my idea was a combination of that idea and also um, a mouseum. So what I did was I took images from the Victoria and Albert Museum of Childhood and the National Building Museum and designed a museum for, kind of for mice, but in miniature, in the walls of the museum. So I had a mouse hole that viewed out onto the pattern of the National Building Museum floor, and you could see a picture through that mouse hole. But in the, in the box itself... It was as if you were in the walls. So I had exposed wood studs and I had electrical conduit running. But what I did was in the steel, I built teeny tiny little houses and like a dollhouse at a a mouse scale. And then on the wall, I made teeny tiny dream rooms, how they would be set up. And they were tiny, like half inch little cubes. And in them, I built as if you had taken apart a mousetrap and made modern art out of the springs and the wood pieces and maybe bits of even cheese. So I made these modern sculptures that were probably less than a quarter inch. Oh my (laughs) God, that is so incredible. I remember seeing the piece. I saw it at the museum. I was just floored. I mean, it was just, just floored by, you know, just the creativity and the composition and... You know, and I think for me, most importantly, is, is you know, one of the reasons why I'm like, I'm so happy to be working with you is because I think your work really helps to transition the concept of miniatures to a much more artful form. Um, you know, people, for the most part, for hundreds of years, have thought of miniatures as dollhouse playthings. And, you know, one of the struggles and the challenges trying to um, encourage folks to see tiny art as exactly that, art. And I think the work that you do in scaling down uh, into to a scale form as a miniature, really in combining that with your creativity, really helps to promote that idea that uh, miniature, miniatures uh, is an art form. So, so, so how do you feel about that when you think about miniatures, when people hear you work in miniature? Um, you know, what is your sense around how you try to communicate what it is you're doing and what you're trying to accomplish? That is always a very difficult question to answer when somebody asks me what, you know, when I tell them I work with steel. Right. What do you do? <laughs> so I, I have a hard time answering that. Um, but in my mind, miniatures to me are making these dioramas or little vignettes. To me, it's about a, a fantasy or a story that you've caught in a moment in time. And you've there's a story behind it. But I, I try to set up part of the story. But I also want the viewer to, to bring in their own imagination. One piece I did was a window seat. And so I basically just built the window seat and um, wall to floor to ceiling bookshelves. And on the um, on the day bed, I had left open a book for bird watching and binoculars. Mm. And just the idea that somebody just walk away from this moment. So mm. I've always just thought miniatures to me was that fantasy world that you could walk into. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think... F- for me, that's what makes, that's what sort of um, bridges the gap between, you know, a, f- a fine miniature, which is an object that is perfectly scaled and perfectly created and crafted, um, and it very often mirrors the full-size piece perfectly. You know, a beautiful miniature chair, to me, is a beautiful miniature chair. 
But once that chair is placed into a scene or, um, or you know, a diorama, as you're calling them, you know, and then there's, there's something happening in there, then that piece becomes, becomes more of an art piece because it's making you think. It's making you feel something uh, more than, oh, how wonderful that is made. Um, so, you know, I, I, you know the, I think that the, the question comes up a lot, especially in, in this category of miniatures, is, you know, what makes a fine art miniature? And I think it goes back to exactly what you're saying. It's that fantasy. It's making you dream. It's making you think. It's making you put yourself in that scene. So, you know, I applaud what you're doing, and I think you're doing it definitely in a new and different way. And, you know, when we talk about the show that's coming up that you're doing, we talk about how... Uh, the work that you've done and the pieces you've created, um, they might be what we've seen before, but they're reimagined. They're reimagined um, in new ways. And we're going to talk a lot about that in the, in the segment that's coming up in the third piece to this three-part um, um, interview with you, Jill. Um, and we're going to talk more about what that work is and how you've been able to reimagine um, some of these very traditional pop icon TV sets uh, in miniature. So thank you for this time. Um, so folks, if, if, if just to remind you, we've got, um, we, we've got a new exhibition of miniatures featuring new work by Jill Orlov. She's a miniaturist out of uh, Baltimore. Um, and we have an open house celebration on Sunday, May 21st from three to five. Come and meet Jill. She's coming down here for this event. And we're also going to plan for a, a pretty spirited discussion around um, how these pieces um, really do move us in certain ways. So, Jill, thank you so much for this time. And we're going to be um, talking again in the third part of this three-part series. In um, So click on it for, for more, okay? Thank you, Jill. You're welcome. Thank you, Darren. All right. Take